Earlier on, the Speaker, Right on Mondo Ojaho, inviting the Minority Leader, the Honorable Seche Men Sabonsu, and the Majority Leader, uh, the Honorable Album Bagwen, to accompany him to go usher the President John Mahama into the House uh, to settle and eventually tell us what the state of the nation is before he leaves office. So that is exactly what you're going to see or what you're going to do at the moment. So on your screens right now is the President being accompanied by security aid and also to be welcomed by the leadership of the House, the Speaker of Parliament, together with the minority and the majority leader. And they're, being, they're filing in, as you see on your screens at the moment, the clerk of Parliament also taking a seat, and then the various uh, leadership uh, of Parliament, both the majority and the minority. So the Speaker, the Right Honorable Doa Joho, also making his way back to his seat after welcoming uh, the members of parliament. So President John Mahama is also climbing at the moment and the presidential seat is right there as you see exactly what you see right there. President John Mahama is going to also take his seat uh, on the presidential seat. Honourable members, the House is privileged to have the presence of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, President of the Republic of Ghana and Commander-in-Chief of the Ghana Armed Forces in the House. His Excellency the President is here in accordance with Article 67 of the Constitution of the Republic to deliver a message on the state of the nation to this house prior to the dissolution of this parliament. On behalf of leadership and honor members of this August House, it is my privilege and singular honor to welcome His Excellency the President to the house. Honor members, I have the greatest pleasure to invite His Excellency, the President, to deliver his message. Your Excellency, you may now deliver your address. Your Excellency, the Vice President, Right Honorable Speaker, your Ladyship, the Chief Justice, Honorable Members of Parliament. Mr. Speaker, allow me to begin by wishing everyone a happy New Year, and let me say Afi Shafa. This hall that exists within these walls is a place where I've always felt at home. It was in this August house, as an MP for Bole Bamboy, that I began my political career. Or better said, it was when I first held public office. The residents of that community, Bole Bamboy, entrusted me with the privilege of representing their best interests in the national dialogue of policymaking and legislation. It seems fitting that I should find myself here in this same house, delivering my final public address, which will in effect bring to a close my tenure as president. I deliver this message on the state of the nation in fulfillment of Article 67 
of the 1992 Constitution in advance of the dissolution of Parliament. It has been a rare honor and privilege for me to serve my country in the highest office as President. It has been a worthwhile journey, and let me seize the opportunity to thank God for His grace and to the good people of Ghana for the opportunity to serve you. May I also respectfully thank my Vice President, Mr. Speaker, Her Ladyship the Chief Justice, and honorable members of this House for the cooperation and solidarity I have enjoyed during my tenure as President. Mr. Speaker, the purpose of this specific State of the Nation Address is to let the people of Ghana know where we stand as a country as the baton of leadership pass from one leader to another. Where are we in this race, so to speak, insofar as nation building, and how is Ghana faring when compared to other nations in Africa and, of course, in the world? Our world has become an increasingly complex one and unpredictable. Majority of economies around the world are sailing against strong headwinds. The world economic crisis and the slowdown in the growth of the Chinese economy has affected the growth of emerging markets and has resulted in a fall in world demand for commodities. As the United States of America makes a slow but steady recovery, the recent increases in the U.S. interest rates means more money is leaving emerging markets and being reinvested back in the, in the U.S. Coupled with the fall in commodity prices on the international market, this is causing an adverse economic outlook for lower middle income economies like ours. Changing climate has made the world weather more unpredictable in our part of the world. Deforestation, sea erosion, tidal waves, erratic rainfall, more severe hamatan are becoming the new normal. These are wreaking havoc on non-irrigated agriculture and power production from hydro sources. The rise of insurgency and failed states in North Africa and the Middle East and religious fundamentalism have resulted in the rise of many terrorist cells that have created a deadly cocktail across the whole world and increasingly in Africa, stretching from the Sahel through West Africa, Central Africa, East Africa, all the way to the Horn of Africa. Our sub-region has not been spared, and attacks as close as Burkina Faso and Cote d'Ivoire have brought the reality of possible terrorist attacks closer to our doorsteps. This is a global context in which our country has had to survive and make progress. Mr. Speaker, at the start of our term in office and for many years prior, there have been national dissatisfaction at the declining standards of education at the basic and secondary levels. Lack of access to both basic and secondary education has meant that many children were being left behind. A shortage of professionally trained teachers, teacher absenteeism, shortage of core textbooks, resulting in a situation in which four children shared one textbook. Dilapidated schools, lack of science laboratories and workshops, among others, manifested in declining results at the Basic Education Certificate Examination, BECE, and West African Secondary School Certificate Examination, WASI. Our vision under my administration has been to turn this situation around and not only improve access to education, but also improve the quality of education. Mr. Speaker, we're witnessing a significant improvement in our educational outcomes. More children than ever before in our history ha are having access to education at the basic and secondary levels. With the distribution of free textbooks, children have access to all the core textbooks and no longer have to share. In excess of 2,000 dilapidated schools, popularly referred to as schools under trees, have been replaced. Teachers are more available and are more evenly distributed than has been the case in the past. Teacher absenteeism is down from 27% to below 9%. Mr. Speaker, this has led to more engagement hours between teachers and students. The construction and population of 47 newly built community day senior high schools means that more students are able to continue their education beyond the basic level instead of dropping out of school. These investments we have made are yielding results and reflecting in the performance of our children. 
Performance at both the Basic Education Certificate Exam, the BECE, and the West African Secondary School Certificate Exam, the WASI, have seen remarkable improvement. The very last batch of BE student, BECE students recorded the highest number of students obtaining a raw score of about 500 marks in the history of this examination. Mr. Speaker, we're recording improved performance in many public schools in the WASI across the country. During the Best School Awards ceremony, many rural and public schools are outperforming some of the better known urban and private schools. Ghana has consistently over the last three years taken the three top spots in the West African School Certificate Examination. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Progressively Free Secondary Education Program under which we have absorbed the major fees paid by day students, has this year been extended to cover 140,000 boarding school students. At the tertiary level, the construction of additional public universities in the Brongahafo and Volta regions have improved access to university education. The short cutting for work to start on the University of Environment and Sustainable Development in the Eastern region the conversion of our polytechnics into technical universities, the creation of three autonomous universities out of the University for Development Studies are all creating additional opportunities for students to pursue courses at the tertiary level. Mr. Speaker, in the area of healthcare, the situation was no different. Many Ghanaians were denied access to quality healthcare. Although in 2004, the Kufour administration had commenced one of the most famous social intervention programs in the health sector on a broader scale. After years of experimentation, the National Health Insurance Scheme utilization was low due to lack of access to health facilities. The sector was characterized by a severe shortage of trained health professionals. Our vision over the period of my administration has been to provide improved health facilities and trained health workers in all nooks and crannies of the country. Construction of new regional hospitals in Bogatanga, Wa, and Accra is dramatically improving the health outcomes for tens of thousands of people. New district hospitals in districts across the country, including the recent ones for which I just cut sword in Hueta to cover Somanya, Bupe, Tolong, and Sola, have and will ad advance even further our policy of providing every district with a first-class health facility. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, new polyclinics, health centers, and CHIPS compounds have also helped to bring quality health care to the doorsteps of our people. This development has resulted in a phenomenal expansion of utilization of the NHIS. Outpatient utilization for 2015 stood at 29 million, up from 9 million in 2008. Increased numbers of trained professionals being churned out of our training institutions has solved the problem of lack of personnel to man our health facilities. Indeed, at the rate at which this category of personnel are being produced, Ghana may need to sign agreements with less endowed countries to officially deploy some of our health professionals to assist improve their health systems. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, as a lower middle income country, income disparities widen the gap between the rich and the poor. To cushion the poor and vulnerable, many social protection programs have been introduced in Ghana. At the start of this administration, the number of people benefiting from these schemes were very few. Under the school feeding program, less than 500,000 children were being fed. Under the livelihood empowerment against poverty program, less than 60,000 households were benefiting. Few children had access to books, school uniforms, and school sandals. Mr. Speaker, our effort under this administration has been to expand the coverage of these programs to cover the majority of the poor and vulnerable population in Ghana. The school feeding program is better managed today under the auspices of the Ministry of Gender, Children, and Social Protection and covers more than 1.5 million children. The LEAP program is benefiting almost 150,000 households. 
The percentage of district assembly common fund meant for persons with disability has been increased by 50%. And school children in public schools are receiving all their core textbooks. Tens of thousands of children have benefited from the free school sandals and free uniforms program. Mr. Speaker, the introduction of the Eban card also means that vulnerable ones among the elderly are receiving some privileges and protection. One of the essentials of life for which social exclusion was evident was in access to clean drinking water. Many rural and urban communities were water starved. Statistics indicate that by the year 2008, 56% of rural people and 58% of urban dwellers had access to portable water. This meant that waterborne diseases were a major affliction and created a heavy incidence of disease on our healthcare system. The universal target is to achieve water for all by the year 2025. Mr. Speaker, our vision has been to achieve this target well in advance of the target date. We have therefore, under my administration, continued to increase investment in the provision of clean drinking water for our people. Provision of boreholes, small town water systems, and major urban water treatment projects have significantly increased access to clean drinking water. Statistics at the end of 2015 show that in excess of 76% of both rural and urban residents have access to potable water. The Teshi desalination plants, the Kong Water Expansion Project, the Akratama Metropolitan Project, Area Project have expanded access to urban water supply in the capital city, Accra. Areas that were traditionally water starved, like Adenta, Teshi, and others today, have access to sufficient drinking water. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, the Wa Water Supply Project, the Three Case Project covering Kumau, Konongo and Kwawu are all projects guaranteeing sustainable water supply to people in these areas. We estimate that under this administration, we've lifted more than 7 million people out of water deprivation. Mr. Speaker, the early years of this government was characterized by a crippling power crisis. The shortage of power led to a very unpopular load management program. This shortage of power hobbled the growth of our economy and affected both business and residential customers. Many businesses had to resort to the use of generators to survive. As a speaker, I stood on the floor of this very August house and took full responsibility for the crisis and promised that I'll do my utmost to fix the problem. It has taken a lot of hard work and effort. Mr. Speaker, it has taken a lot of hard work and effort, fast-tracking the deployment of emergency plans and speeding up the completion of ongoing plans ensured that we added more than 800 megawatts of power over an 18-month period. This increased generation in addition to the energy sector levy and ongoing works to restructure the legacy debt of the power utilities has helped to stabilize the power situation in our country. With the expectation of more domestic gas from the 10 and Sankofa fields, Ghana is entering into an era of energy self-sufficiency. Indeed, the warning signals have started sounding about the danger of overcapacity and excess redundancy in our power generation sector. We have agreed to work with the World Bank to rationalize the addition of new plants and ensure that we achieve optimum utilization of existing plant capacity. Mr. Speaker, access to power under my administration has continued to increase. Ghana has one of the highest access to electricity, estimated to be above 80% currently. Yeah. Additional pending electrification programs like the China Water Company Program and the Hunan Energy Projects will bring even more communities onto the national grid. As a speaker, we inherited an economy that was running a high deficit with increasing inflation and interest rates. It was also characterized by a rapidly depreciating currency. This unstable macroeconomic environment 
created an unfavorable investment environment, both for indigenous and foreign capital. Our forum at Senchi was an attempt to forge a consensus for a homegrown fiscal consolidation program. Mr. Speaker, the Senchi outcome eventually became the basis for the IMF extended credit facility that we are implementing. The ECF program, as it's called, has resulted in an improved macro environment, which has seen a steady decline in inflation and interest rates. A new public debt management strategy is also seeing a steady decline in the public sector debt, estimated to have dropped from nearly 75% to below 65% currently. Our currency, the CD, has also this year enjoyed relative stability, depreciating at just above 4% this year. Mr. Speaker, while the deficit target for this year might be missed on account of inability to meet revenue targets, it is important for us to continue to pursue fiscal consolidation in the third and final year of the IMF program. Multiple causes are responsible for this inability to meet the target. Reduced lifting from the Jubilee field on account of the tariff bearing problems, non-realization of some expected non-tax revenues such as the sale of electromagnetic spectrum, reduced cocoa export revenues, and higher than expected election-related expenditures. In spite of the breach of the fiscal deficit target, expenditure was lower than programmed, and thus the approved appropriation for 2016 was not ex exceeded. Mr. Speaker, it is my belief that we continue a diligent, diligent implementation of the IMF program till the end of 2017 in order that we can create a stable and sustainable economy. Mr. Speaker, Ghana's economy is still the second largest in West Africa, with a GDP of almost $39 billion. Ghana has also moved up 13 places in the Ease of Doing Business Index and is currently considered number one on the World Bank Index for West Africa. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, does widespread dissatisfaction with the road network in the country. Complaints covered poor state of urban roads, feeder roads, and highways. Many hours of sitting in traffic caused frustration and discomfort for urban commuters. Poor feeder roads and pothole-ridden highways increased maintenance costs for drivers and in turn led to increased fares and transport charges for goods. My tenure of office has seen some of the most massive investments in the road sector in the history of Ghana. Yeah. My vision was to finish off road projects inherited, such as Achimota of Ankor, Awoshi Pokwase, Sufo Line, Tetokwashi Adenta, etc. We also commenced and completed the Kwame Nkrumah interchange. We fast tracked the construction and opening of the Kaswa overhead bridge. We completed the Airport Hills Bema Camp network of roads and completed the 37 Elwak Trade Fair Road. We've also invested more resources in continuing the Eastern Corridor Road project, asphalt overlay of roads in regional and district capitals, and massive investments in cocoa roads across the country. These have opened up our country significantly. Many other projects are ongoing, such as the Temamoto Way runabout decongestion project, a new bridge from Flowerport runabout on the Spintex Road over the Accra Temamoto Way into East Ligon. The others ready to commence with financing arranged, such as the Obichebilamte interchange, the Pokwase interchange, and the motorway expansion project, amongst others. Mr. Speaker, the transport sector has also experienced marked improvements under this administration. Incentives such as reduction in cost of aviation fuel, improved airport infrastructure has seen a massive increase in both domestic and international travel. The Terminal 3 project at the Kotoka International Airport is progressing fast and when completed will make Accra the most favored aviation destination in the whole of West Africa. Already, the completed rehabilitation of the arrival hall in Terminal 2 has created much better comfort for passengers using Accra Airport. 
Kumasi and Tamale Airport expansion will also see increased uh, passenger movement domestically. Wa and Ho are advancing steadily and hope to be open to commercial travel soon. Commencement of the bus rapid transit with dedicated bus lanes christened Ayalulu Express will create better comfort for urban commuters. Urban rail systems like the Sekendi Kojokrom Takrade line will ease the inconvenience of commuters in the twin cities. The Tema Akosumbo line will soon start to maximize the use of the Volta Lake Transport Company for moving cargo for landlocked Sahelian countries up the Volta River to Buipe in the northern region. Work on the expansion of our two maritime ports at Takradi and Tema are ongoing and would lead to faster turnaround times for ships and larger throughput cargo volumes. Bulk cargo handling will also be more efficient. Mr. Speaker, our security forces were severely challenged when it came to logistics and equipment to fulfill their constitutional mandate. Today, I can report with pride that vehicles, armored personnel carriers, route control equipment, aircrafts, helicopters, fire tenders make up a few of the components of the investments we have made in our security services. Yes. Mr. Speaker, vehicles for judges and completion of the court complex has created a better atmosphere for the dispensation of justice. Implementation of the National Anti-Corruption Action Plan, which was unanimously adopted by this August House, remains on track. I wish to commend this House for the passage of numerous legislation, including the recent Public Financial Management Act, which strengthens our hands in the fight against corruption. I must, however, say, I must, however, point out that public and civil society organizations are disappointed in our inability to pass the Right to Information Bill and are still hopeful that before this parliament is dissolved at midnight on the 6th of January, a consensus can be found to pass this bill into law. Mr. Speaker, the achievements outlined in this statement are accomplishments that my government and I can proudly claim. But the state of our nation at any given time, where we are in the race, is the result of more than the visible gains made by one individual during his tenure. Every president inherits the unfinished work of his predecessor. Every president benefits from the seeds planted by his predecessor. Seeds that could not be sown during his predecessor's tenure. Mr. Speaker, indeed I believe if politics could be described as a sport, the one it would most closely resemble is a relay race. It is a sport that relies as much on the individual's achievement as it does on teamwork and cooperative effort. The true test of that comp competition is in the passing of the baton. So too with politics. Mr. Speaker, President Jerry John Rawlings started the structural transformation of this economy under the Economic Recovery Program. This program restored Ghana to a path of growth, which he handed over to President John Ajekum Kufo. President Kufo continued the Economic Adjustment Program and under HIPIC initiative, achieved significant debt reduction. Implementing new social intervention programs such as NHIS and the Livelihood Empowerment Against Poverty Program, he passed these on to Pre Pro President Professor John Ivan Sata Mills. President Mills commenced the Eastern Corridor Road Project, the University of Ghana Medical Center, which I inaugurated yesterday, the Kotokraba Market, the Cape Coast Stadium, and a host of others which I inherited and completed. Mr. Speaker, my administration commenced the construction of new Community Day Senior High Schools, a policy of progressively free secondary education, construction of the Eastern University, investment in many infrastructure projects that are ongoing, and many others that will actually commence under present Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu.
Mr. Speaker, I am assured by his firm statement that he will continue these projects as enjoined by our Constitution of 1992. Mr. Speaker, I wish him all the success in this regard. And as I've said many times already, regardless of whose tenure in which these visions come to fruition, its success belongs to Ghana. They belong to all of us. Mr. Speaker, political opposition and differences of opinion are vital to the health and growth of any democracy. Political parties are formed when people of similar ideology come together to move their agenda forward in a way that best serves their country's in interest. But the well-being of the nation and the will of the people must always come first. Partisanship for its own sake in the end is no better than dictatorship. If we look around the world, we can so clearly see the deep divide that blind partisanship is creating in nations with democracies that are even far older than ours. We can see, too, the divide that it is threatening to create in ours if we are not careful. Already it's taking a toll on our morale and our sense of optimism. It has given way to a cynicism that is as dangerous to the incoming political party as it is to the outgoing. We cannot afford as a nation to wish or hope for the failure of any president and his or her government. Ensuring accountability is not the same as leveling insults or encouraging apathy. We have, we have history as proof that we have been better and that we have done better and that we will, we must do better once again. Mr. Speaker, I first entered this house as MP for Bole Bamboy in January 1997. It was perhaps not coincidental that the same year, Nana Adwadankwa Akufado entered as MP for Achema Bwakwa. Taking breaks from the business of the house, taking breaks from the business of the house to grab something to eat at a snack bar, Nanado always stood at the end of the counter, his signature white handkerchief tucked into his sleeve. Johnny, he would shout in greeting as he preferred to call me. Incidentally, we both served three terms in this house, departing together in, the, in January 2009. This is how long I've known the president-elect, or we have known each other and worked together. I have the utmost respect for him, given our history, especially that we have each had, we have each had our turn at each side of a presidential election, it would seem only natural for us to be considered opponents. Worthy opponents is the description generally used in the world of sports. In fact, Mr. Speaker, we are all on the same team as Ghanaians. We worked together when I served as ranking member on the Committee of Foreign Affairs at a time that Danado was the Minister for Foreign Affairs and Regional Integration. One of the issues on which we crossed swords was the murder of some Ghanaian youth in the Gambia. It is instructive that as I leave office and as he takes my place, Gambia once again is a nation that is engaging international attention. Mr. Speaker, it is my assertion that the information I've provided is a snapshot of the current state of our nation. As I've said before, I'll allow history to be the judge of how I have served my nation. How well I have done my part in running my lap of that relay. What that verdict will ultimately be, I cannot say. I can only say that I have done my best, given my all, and done so with the best of intentions for my God and my country. Our country, Ghana. This is why I stand here today, Mr. Speaker, holding the baton of leadership, prepared to pass it on with pride, goodwill, and determination to Nana Adudankwa Akufuadu 
and to ask all Ghanaians to cheer him on as he runs his portion of this important relay for Ghana. Mr. Speaker, I thank you, I thank members of this House, and I thank the citizens of Ghana for the opportunity you have given me. May God bless you, and may God continue to bless our beloved homeland, Ghana. I thank you.